But we're delighted that we can come week after week on the various platforms and so that you can be ministered to. But our desire is that you attend the gathering. God's word says very clearly that we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And so please, while this is a blessing to you and these brethren have been working hard to exposit the word, please make it a point to be part of the gathering every Sunday. God bless you. Well, good afternoon, everyone, brothers and sisters. Uh, it's great to see you this morning. Um, please, did I say good morning again? This is going to be run the running gag now. Josh can't say good afternoon. <laughs> My apologies. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so we're going to be starting today. Please uh, stand up uh, as we're going to be reading from God's Word from Psalm 108. Please turn to Psalm 108. Obviously, we will be starting from verse 1. So Psalm chapter 108, verse 1. All right. A song, a psalm of David. My heart is steadfast, O God. I will sing and make melody with all my being. Awake, O harp and lyre. I will awake the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your steadfast love is great above the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above all the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth, that your beloved ones may be delivered. Give salvation by your right hand and answer me. God has promised in his holiness. With exaltation, I will divide up Sheshem and portion of the valley of Sukkoth. Gilead is mine, Manasseh is mine, Ephraim is my helmet, Judah my scepter, Moab is my wash basin, upon Edom I cast my shoe, over Philistia I shout in triumph, who will bring me to the fortified city, who will lead me to Edom? Have you not rejected us, O God? You do not go out, O God, with our armies. O oh, grant us help against the foe, your vain, for vain is the salvation of man. With God we shall do valiantly. It is he who will tread down our foes. Father, we thank you that we can come together today to give you glory, to worship you to sing and worship you together as one body, Father. It is true, we sing and we make melody with all our being, Father. May we be able to not only sing today, but sing tomorrow and sing day after day with not only our voice, but with our, our actions and our lives, Father. May they be a living testimony of what you have done in our lives and what you keep doing and sanctifying us in our lives every day. We give thanks to you for all that you've done, and Lord, may our lives be, uh, uh, be a, a split image of who we ought to be in Christ before all the peoples. May we be a an example, Father, and help us to be that example in you. Father, your steadfast love is great and your faithfulness is unwavering. Your steadfast, Father, it is this steadfast, uh, this love is steadfast, it is firm, it is unwavering, it does not change. Those who have loved, those who, who you have saved, Lord, you will never stop loving. And Father, we thank you that your love is sure. It is not something that changes, but, but when you love us, Father, we are counted as your people. And Father, um, as the psalm speaks of, of Israel and how you use Israel and you, Father, you, uh, you deliver them, you are today even our deliverer. Father, the victory is already won in your name. Death, where is your sting? Father, you have come, Jesus, and, and died and on the cross, and because of you, we can now 
live until you come back for your bride. And, and, and Father, you prepare us for that day. I pray that you continue to prepare your church as you have said in your scriptures that you will. Father, I pray that today we may sing for those two reasons, that we sing uh, in thankfulness for the fact that your love is steadfast and your faithfulness reaches to the clouds, but also, Father, that we may come and, um, and sing uh, and show our dependence upon you and ask for your help in our lives today. I pray, Lord, that you be with Andrew as he, as he uh, prepared this message today. May we be able to reflect on what he has brought today, what you are bringing through him. And Lord, I pray that as we sing, we may sing in one accord in your name. Amen. Good afternoon. Please stay standing as we sing this first song together, The Saving One. and peace my fate was surely sealed until he rescued me his pardon for my sin his bounty for my need from slavery and shame I am redeemed and heaven can contain the glory of the sun other song which was introduced recently based on Psalm 90, Satisfy Us With Your Love.
the day has passed us by before our hearts forget all your goodness satisfy us with your you, Lord, because you have indeed satisfied us, first by satisfying the wrath of God that is claiming our lives because we have sinned against him. But Lord, we thank you because you have ransomed for yourself a people that now we are coming together to worship you and praise you and to sing Yes, indeed, Lord, you have satisfied us. Now, Lord, we ask you that you would fill us with your spirit. I pray that you would be with us 
as we meditate on your word. May the meditation of our hearts and the praises of our lips be pleasing unto you, O Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would bless every single one of us here this afternoon. I pray this in the mighty name of our Savior and God, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please have a seat. By this we know the new commandment. It is the title of our message today in our expository series through 1 John. I pray that this would be indeed a timely message. So now that I've given you a break, I'll invite you to stand up once more and open up your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2. And we're going to pick up where we left off last week. In verse 7 and 8, the Apostle John says, Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away. And the true light is already shining. Let's pray. Father, I pray, God, that you would be with us as we read your word, as we meditate on it, that you would help me be clear and help the hearer hear your word, understand it, and obey it. I pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Have a seat. I hope you have your Bibles today because we have a lot of Scripture to cover. And if you need a Bible and you don't have one, please raise your hand. One of the ushers will go and fetch you a Bible. There's a phrase on your screen. It's a Latin phrase. It, is, it says, Unos Christianos. Nullus Christianos. This is a Latin phrase from the ancient church. And it is translated in English, one Christian, no Christian. This denotes the reality that those who think they are Christians and living in isolation from the congregation, from the gathering of the saints, are in fact no Christians at all. They do not understand the gospel. Unfortunately today, there are many Christians who are living in that way. They live as though they are in isolation, that Christ just saved them alone. They profess Christ, you see, but they do not obey him. In their mind, Christ is not Lord they don't really understand what that means. Christ for them is not a king who reigns over their lives. Instead, Christ for them is a buddy who makes suggestions for them to better and improve their lives. They do not understand that Christ is king who makes commandments, who commands his people. They think by these suggestions, and instead of commandments, they take them as suggestions in their lives, and they think they have the freedom to conform to these commandments or not. They think a Christian is someone who reads their Bible and prays every now and then, you know, whenever they have time. But they are deeply mistaken. And this could not be farther from the truth. The reality is, is that no one is a Christian unless they are born again. Let me say this again. No one is a Christian unless they are born from above, born of God. What does that mean? Well, it means that they have had a change 
and disposition. They have changed from walking in their own ways to walking in God's ways. Not doing what they think is right in their own sight, but doing what God commands. They believe that God is king. Those who are born again obey their king. Why? Because they love the Lord their God with all of their heart, with all of their mind, with all of their strength. And they love their neighbor as their selves. How did they get there? Because they have had a change from inside. And they know, those who are born again, they know that Christ died for their sins in order to ransom for himself a people, to redeem a people from every nation, from every tribe, with every tongue. And they recognize that they have to join together with other believers in local congregations to worship the Lord God, to have biblical accountability, to grow in Christian maturity. So they can grow in the knowledge of the Son of God. And they can grow in sanctification. Why? Because they love God. And they love His people. And so they work together to grow and to work together to build the church, to build the kingdom of God. Brother and sister, friend, you need to know this. There's an irreconcilable divide between the former type of so-called Christian, a nominal Christian, and a born-again Christian. This divide is so massive. It's like I said, irreconcilable. On the one hand, the nominal Christian thinks that he is a Christian while despising the Word of God and not joining together with the saints, hating the bride. He might not say that he hates the bride, that is the church, but by his action, he shows it. Someone who is born again, loves the Word of God, obeys the commands of Christ, and he does what? He loves his bride. Why? Because he loves those whom Christ loved. So we can ask a question. How can we obey Christ? How can we live according to his commandments? And this is the objective of today. In these two verses, I want to help you understand the new commandment that is to love one another in the context of the local church. You need to understand that this commandment is rooted in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And through the gospel, the light of the gospel would show in your heart. And that light will dispel the darkness that is passing away. Behold, a new has come. In order for us to achieve this objective, for you to understand this, you need to understand three specific motifs, if you will, or three specific threads, components, that are part of this Two, these two verses, you will have them on your screen. The first is this. The new commandment is from the Lord Jesus, is from him, and it is representative of who he is. Number two, the new commandment is applied in the context of the local church. Number three, obedience to the new commandment is a sign of true faith. Now, I want you to not misunderstand. These are not three points that we will go through. These are three points that through these two verses, you will see them intertwined. Let's begin with our exposition from verse 7. Look at your Bibles. And you'll have it also on your screen. The apostle says, Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. Now, let's take this phrase by phrase. The first phrase, he says, beloved. And as if he's giving us a hint of what he's about to say. You see, beloved is he saying that you are my beloved, but you are also the beloved of Christ. 
And he continues, he says, I am writing you no new commandment. He's saying that this commandment that I'm commanding you has accompanied the preaching of the gospel, which you have believed from the beginning. This is nothing novel. This is nothing new. This is how you believed from the beginning. It is based on the authority of the apostles, that is John himself who is writing this, and his authority is rooted in what? In God himself. Because he derives his authority, it originates in God. And he preached the word which they have believed from the beginning. And this word is not a suggestion. It is a commandment. And what is happening here in the Asian church, in Asia Minor, which we said already, this is the context of the Asian churches in Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey, and they had a problem. They had a bunch of Gnostics running around pro proclaiming a, a counterfeit gospel and what the apostle calls an antichrist gospel. It is something that contradicts what they have preached. And of course, we already said this before. They had two problems. They had a problem in their belief and they had a problem in their practice. We talked about this before. Orthodoxy and orthopraxy. Orthodoxy means right belief. Orthopraxy means right behavior. They are inseparable. What is the wrong belief that Gnostics were preaching? Well, they were preaching that Christ is God, but he never came in the flesh. And that led to our problems in their practices. So they did not have orthopraxy, they had wrong practices. And so they were proclaiming a different gospel. They were telling Christians that they can live a life of self-indulgence. They can live a self-serving life. They can live a life individualistically, isolated from the commands of God. Indeed, they have lived a life of licentiousness. They have defiled their physical body, and they have defiled the spiritual body of Christ by reaping the, the sow, what, what they sowed, which is the false doctrine, they were reaping the dissension and disunity in the church. Now, you need to understand this very clearly. The Gnostic theology that goes against apostolic teaching was going against that Christ, specifically, that Christ, who is God, became man. And as a result of that, they refused the law of God. They rejected the law of God. They thought they can live in whichever way they wanted to live. And there's a problem with that. Because the rejection of Christ's humanity will inevitably lead you to the rejection of the law he came to fulfill. You see, if he, God, did not come to be man, then he did not fulfill the law. That means we cannot look to Christ as an example to be followed. If he is just some sort of spirit in the abstract, you cannot follow Christ and walk in the same way in which he walked. Verse 6, how can you walk in the same way in which he walked if he was not made man? And fulfilled the law. You see, in the Gospel of Matthew, you don't have to turn there. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 17 to 18. Christ said, I have come to fulfill the law. Not to abolish it. And also, in Matthew, chapter 22, verse 37 to 40. He also said when he was asked, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus responded, to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, that is the greatest commandment and the first. And the second is like it, that you love your neighbor as yourself. In these two commandments rests the law and the prophets. So as a Christian, what are you going to do? Reject the law and the prophets? That's what he was saying. Well, you cannot reject the law and the prophets. I am writing to you no new commandment. You know this. You know these commandments came from the Lord. 
Do not allow this novel theology, this relatively new theology, to come and destroy the work of God. Let me show you. Let's turn to the Gospel of John chapter 13 and to really define what is this new commandment that he's talking about. John chapter 13. You need to now pay close attention to this because this is really the heart of this sermon, the new commandment. We're going to pick up from verse 31 to 35. Before we read, I want you to know this. This is occurring in the context of the Lord's Supper. So this is literally when Jesus was reclined on the table with the disciples around him, and he's about to break bread excuse me, and tell them to do what? To do this in remembrance of him. That the bread resembles his body broken for their sins. And the wine resembles the blood that he shed for the remission of sins. And in the context of the Lord's Supper, he says this. Look in verse 31. When he had gone out, he's talking about Judas. So, which is, which is by the way, very curious and interesting. Judas is out of the picture. He is talking to the true church, to the elect of God. And it, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, a phrase that the Apostle John likes to use even in his epistle. Little children, Jesus continues, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me. And just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. Now pay attention. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. It's very important. This phrase, every time it is, you read it in, the, in your English translation, one another, in the New Testament, it always denotes an inter-Christian relationship. Let me repeat this again. Every time it says one another, all the one another's in the New Testament, it always denotes an inter-Christian relationship within the context of the local church. And of course, by extension, the church universal or the Catholic church. Catholic means universal. And so we understand that this is a commandment particularly for those who are members of the covenant that Christ have made with his blood and broken body. And now we can ask the question, you see it on the screen, but why does Christ connect loving him with loving other Christians? We know what the new commandment is, to love one another. But why does he connect loving one another with loving him? Well, to answer this question, we have to go to 1 John and meditate back to our epistle in chapter 4, verse 7 through 13. This is an important passage. So I want you, again, to really pay attention. Now he repeats the same phrase that we just read earlier in our main passage, beloved, in verse 7. So 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. We're going to read until verse 13. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is, is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, 
If God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. Notice in verse 10, where he says that he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And he connects it, the following verse, to we ought to love one another. So his propitiation is connected with obedience to the command, the new commandment, that is to love one another. Those who have been ransomed by the blood of Jesus are the same ones who love each other. And notice he says in verse 12, no one has ever seen God. And this verse is not in your, on your screen, but look, it, it is there in your Bible. Look at verse 20. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For, the, for he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this is the commandment we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. And he is not talking about your sibling. He knows, of course, you love your siblings. He's talking about your brothers and sisters in the church. Of course, this teaching is really, really irks the progressive Christians. We talked about them throughout this series. The progressive Christians, we talked about them, are actually... Um, uh, Michael J. Kruger, I wanted to mention this before we move on. Michael J. Kruger wrote the book... Ten Commandments of Progressive Christianity. I'm saying this just for the sake of those I see some new faces here. He wrote the book that he's debunking the progressive Christian movement. And throughout this series, we have been going through these ten commandments of the progressive Christian movement. For this example, I'm going to use two of their commandments. The seventh and eighth commandment, according to Philip Gully, who wrote a book in 2010. It's, the title is, uh, If the Church Were Christians... Rediscovering the values of Jesus. And so he says this in his book. That meeting actual needs is more important than power. Of course, by which they mean maintaining institutions. The institution that they have in mind is the church of Jesus Christ. Progressive Christians say, let's just do good deeds, not build the church. If you're about the church, then you're not about the people. We already discussed this before. In the second sermon, or third sermon specifically, I mentioned that they also say the same thing when it comes to theology. If you're about theology, then you're not about people. The eighth commandment says, peacemaking is more important than power. Again, the word power here, they mean the church. Another anti-institutional sentiment, they are concerned about the church hierarchy, calling it authoritarianism. Now, this anti-institutional sentiment is rooted in another ideology that is not Christian. You see, they look at the church as if it is a, a, a man-made institution instead of a divinely ordained institution. They think the church ought to focus on healing the social ills of society, like a charity of sorts, like a social justice organization, that we ought to Leave the gospel, leave the preaching of the gospel, the correction, discipline, and proper theology, and focus instead on activism. And so they view those who are so concerned about the church as those who are concerned about lording power over people. You understand? And that's their problem. And so they say, if you're about the church, about maintaining the organism of the church, of course they recognize the church is not a building, it is an organism of people joined together according to the mind of Christ. But they say, if you're concerned about the church and the inter-church relationships, then you are not concerned about the world. Well, that goes against biblical teaching. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 
verse 25. This is the Apostle Paul speaking to the church in Ephesus. I'll give you a moment to turn there. Paul says this, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Look right at me. Does the church have issues? Yes, it does. But that is no ground for you to abandon the gathering of the saints and to isolate yourself alone. They have a problem with the church because they do not believe that Christ loved the church. They do not believe that Christ, by the power of the word and by the spirit of our God, will cleanse her. They do not believe the promise that Christ just promised that he will sanctify her and he will present her holy with all glory and splendor before him. They do not believe that. And this goes against what John says. I want you to keep your finger in Ephesians 5, because we're going to come back here in a moment, I want you to go quickly to 1 John chapter 1. I want to remind you of two verses in verse 3 and verse 4. Chapter 1, 1 John chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. The apostle says this, That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father, and with his son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. I want you to notice something. That he linked our fellowship with the Father through his son, Jesus Christ, with our fellowship with each other. They're interlinked. They are inseparable. And he says, there is joy in that. When we say... Unos cristianos, nulos cristianos, or one Christian, no Christian. What do we mean by that? Well, the ancient church understood this. You have this quote on the screen. True or authentic Christian love can only occur within the context of a lawful covenant relationship. Again, True Christian love can only occur within the context of a lawful covenant relationship. Then you probably wonder, what, what does this have to do with Ephesians 5? You see, in Ephesians 5, he's exhorting, Paul is exhorting the husbands to love the wives as Christ loved the church. Why? Because between a husband and a wife, there's a covenant. They have come together in love. And they made a covenant before God and the two became one flesh. And the fruit of this covenant is what? The children. And the children love each other. Similarly, Christ loved his bride. And he has a covenant with the bride. And the children out of this love between Christ and his bride are the children who are born of God. Who are born by the preaching of the word of God. They are in the covenant. They are the fruit of this covenant relationship. And so, if there's a child there who does not love his brothers and sisters in Christ, then that child is an illegitimate child. That's what it means. Now, let me paint you a picture. There are many Christians. Maybe you have come across them who spend more time hanging out with their worldly pagan friends, loving them, serving them, going out of their way for them, forgiving them. I'm not saying this is bad. All I'm saying is that they will do this every day, every hour of the day. But they wouldn't do half of that for their brothers and sisters 
in Christ. Why do they feel that they are understood on the other side? That they belong to the children of darkness? That they want a fellowship with the children of darkness over and against the fellowship with the children of light? There's something terribly wrong with that picture, isn't there? Why don't you love your brothers and sisters in Christ? Why do you not want to invest in a relationship with them? Why don't you want to spend time with them? Church, what is the raison d'etre? What is the purpose of the church? Well, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4, just a page back. We're going to pick up from verse 11. And the apostle here tells us what did Christ do. Christ died for us, and what did he do? He, he ransomed for himself one body. He has given that body one spirit, verse 4. He is one Lord, there is one faith, and there is one baptism. And as a result of that, I, this one I'm going to pick up in verse 11. Paul says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, these are those, those who wrote scripture, the shepherds and the teachers, those are the pastors. Why? Why did he give the scripture and the pastors? Well, the elders. Verse 2 tells us, To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Building up the body of Christ. So the progressive Christian movement wants us to tear down the body of Christ in order to do their social justice activism. But who gives us the body? Who established the body? Who died for the body? Well, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And he has equipped the body with spiritual gifts in order for the body to be built up in him. Let's go up to the following verse, verse 13. Until we all attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful scheming. Look right at me. What is the teaching of the Gnostics if it was not deceitful scheming? What is the progressive Christian movement's teaching if it was not winds of doctrine that is foreign to the Word of God? What is this isolated Christian who's living in his own, who claims that he has a church amongst his own wife and children? That's not a church, that's called your family. You love your family because they are your family. The whole point is to join together with people from every nation, from every tongue, to come together. You're not self-reliant. You're not autonomous. You're not self-sufficient. You're not God. You need the body, and the body needs you. We continue. Verse 15. Rather, speaking the truth in love. What is that? Correction, discipline. What does it do? Well, we grow in sanctification. Look at the following phrase. We are to grow up in every way unto him who is the head un into Christ. From whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. It builds itself up in the new commandment as they love one another. And notice in the last, last verse here, the whole body joined and held together. And it says, by every joint, that means every single Christian with which it is equipped when each part, each individual Christian joined together 
creating the body of Christ. That's how the body is supposed to function, how it is intended to function. This is not some theologian in the medieval time thinking up, you know what, wouldn't it be great to just bring a bunch of people together so we can lord it, lord our power over them? It is right here in the Word of God. So, let's summarize this. This section here. In the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith, in the article, the, the chapter, the 26th chapter on the church, in paragraph 6, it says this. The members of these churches are saints by calling, visibly displaying and demonstrating in and by their profession and life their obedience to the call of Christ. They willingly agree to live together according to Christ's instructions, giving themselves to the Lord and to one another by the will of God, with the stated purpose of following the ordinances of the gospel. In the following chapter, in chapter 27, the second paragraph, we read this. Saints by profession, those who are professing that Jesus Christ is Lord, saints by profession are obligated, they are obligated to maintain a holy fellowship and communion in worshiping God and in performing other spiritual services that promote their mutual edification. They are to aid each other in material things according to their various abilities and needs. They should especially exercise communion in the relationships they have in their families and churches. Yet the rule of the gospel also directs them, as God, as God provides opportunity, to extend their sharing to the whole household of faith, to all those who in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus. Nevertheless, their communion with one another as saints does not take away or infringe on the title or individual ownership that people have in their goods and possessions. In other words, we're not communists. So now, let's turn to 1 John. Let's go back to our passage. And we're going to go to verse 8. The apostle says this. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Now, let's go back to the three objectives or the three components of this passage. It's very important that you understand that all these three components converge together on this passage. The first, the new commandment is from the Lord Jesus. It is rooted in the Lord Jesus. The new commandment, which is to love one another, as we said, is applied in the context of the local church. So if you want to obey the new commandment, well, you've got to join yourself a church. You have to commit to a local church. Obedience to the new commandment, that's number three, is a sign of true faith. And all of these things, we already discussed them, and we're going to emphasize them in this following verse. He says, at the same time, it is a new commandment. Well, that's confusing, because the previous verse, he says, I'm writing you no new commandment. And now he says, it is a new commandment. What does he mean? Well, in the previous verse, he says, it is not a new commandment in relationship to the teachings of the Gnostics. This is what you believed from the beginning, the preaching of the word from the apostles in relationship to the novel theology of the Gnostics. But here he says he means something else. He means in particularly what Jesus called the new commandment. And he says, at the same time, it is a new commandment. John Calvin says, new commandment, it is new in the sense it is abiding. It is enduring for every Christian to love his brother and sister. We're going to see this in John chapter 15. Now, we immediately have an issue, and you'll see this question on the screen. What does love mean? You said love one another. What does love mean as a moral imperative in a postmodern world, in the 21st century? What does love mean? 
in the postmodern world? Well, it means whatever you want it to mean. That's the problem. In a postmodern world, in the world in which we live, love, whatever suits you, whatever floats your boat, is love. But that's a problem, right? Well, let's see what the Apostle John has to say about love. Go back to chapter 4 in the same epistle. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. This is very important. He says this. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. That means love has its source in who? In God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Verse 8, anyone who does not love does not know God because, and this is the key, God is love. It is rooted in the character of God himself. So you cannot define it in whichever way you want. Now, in our social context today, I've read this a news article on CTV News about a worker in British Columbia. This worker, um, uh, she's a female, I think, who's, who's uh, gender confused. So she goes to her employer and she insists that her employer ought to refer to her with her preferred pronoun. That is they or their. Obviously, the employer did not necessarily comply with that. And so what she did, she went to court and she filed a lawsuit. The judge granted her claims. And now the employer has to award the worker $30,000. Now, let's bring this in the church. Let's bring it within family. In 2019, J.D. Greer, the former president of the largest Protestant conservative denomination in the world called the Southern Baptist Convention, he wrote an article. He exhorted the Christians to exercise, and I quote, pronoun hospitality in the spirit of generosity, over and against, quote, telling the truth. Well, that's, that's a problem. What do you think the apostle meant when he said, love one another? Do you think he meant whatever your cultural context defines love? Of course not. The apostle had in the backdrop the scriptures, the law of God. And so let's go back to the root of the law of God. Where Remember, we said, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Where do we find this, love your neighbor as yourself? In the Old Testament, in Leviticus. Turn with me to Leviticus chapter 19. And, and before we read this, I want you to appreciate the irony of, of this, this, this whole context when they're saying, we'll love them in a sense that you accommodate their pronoun. The irony of all of this is love your neighbor in the law of God in Leviticus chapter 19 falls in the context, the greater context of which, which we call the holiness code. From Leviticus chapter 17 to Leviticus chapter 26, this is called the Holiness Code. And in chapter 18 through 20, the irony, it is addressing all the prohibition of sexual immorality. Homosexuality, fornication, everything basically that our society despises in our Bible. It is in this context where we find love your neighbor in chapter 19. Let's read. We're going to skip through a couple of verses. So we're going to go from verse 1 to verse 18. So pay attention. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I the Lord your God am holy. Every one of you shall rever revere his mother and his father, and you shall keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Do not turn to idols 
or make your, your, for yourselves any gods of cast metal. I am the Lord your God. Let's skip to verse 9. Or rather, let's skip to verse 11. You shall not steal. You shall not deal falsely. You shall not lie to one another. You shall not swear by my name falsely, meaning being a false witness. And so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. You shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired worker shall not remain with you all night until the morning. You shall not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind. But you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. You shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. But in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people. And you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. But you shall reason frankly with your neighbor. Lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people. But you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Now, there are three things or four things I want you to take from this. And they're all connected. The first thing, you see the repeated refrain. I am the Lord. I am the Lord your God. I am the Lord. Be holy as I am holy. Therefore, we can safely conclude that all the moral obligations we just read are rooted in the holiness of God, in the very character of God. And so we understand that all of these moral obligations are defined by God himself. And it also tells us that God is sovereign over the moral lives of his people, whom he has a covenant with. So they cannot add or subtract from the moral law of God without incurring a grievous sin against God himself. So it's not up to the church to redefine love in the context of your culture or whichever culture it is. The church cannot give the keys to someone else. There is one authority and there is one sovereign ruler over the church. And that is God and God alone. The church cannot allow the culture to dictate to her what is the moral obligations of her conduct. That's not Christianity. That's not what it means to say Jesus Christ is Lord. He is king. He is sovereign. He's not your buddy. He does not make suggestions. He makes commands. And those who are born again do what? Obey the commands. Begrudgingly? Absolutely not. Willingly. Joyfully. Lovingly. Why? Because they love the Lord your God, their God with all of their heart, with all of their mind, with all of their strength. And they love their neighbor as themselves. But, but in loving them, they are in no way allowed to disobey and twist the moral obligations that they have according to the defined parameters of the law of God. Well, that's a problem, isn't it? Because we will be singled out in our society as the enemies of a good and just society. We will be bigots. And that really is fitting to what the Apostle John says in John chapter 15. Turn with me there. The Gospel of John chapter 15. This is another lengthy passage. But it is pivotal. It is critical to our understanding of the new commandment. 
We're going to pick up from verse 8 to verse 22. John, the Gospel of John chapter 15. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. So, what do we get from this? That if you want to bear fruit, you ought to act like Christ. Christ kept the, kept the commandments of God, and you too, Christian, ought to keep the commandments of the Lord. And he says in verse 11, These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Who are his friends? Let me tell you. His friends doesn't mean your buddies from the bar that you watched the Habs game with last year. Your friends are the brothers and sisters in the church. And you will notice this immediately from the following verse. You are my friends if you do what I command you. This is in the context of the local church. Now, I want you to keep your finger in John 15. And I want to show you something. Go back to the gospel, to, sorry, that, to our uh, passage. And we read in verse 8. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you. What does that mean? It is true in him and in you. Well, he just told us. He told us in John chapter 15. I hope you did not miss it. Go back to John 15. And he said that you would bear Fruit, just in verse 10, so he said that in verse 8, that you would bear uh, fruit, so prove to be my disciples. In verse 10, the final phrase he says, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. It is true in Him, in Jesus, who obeyed the commandment of the Father and is also true in you. Why? Because you bear the fruit of your faith. You get that? It is true in Him and it's true in you. He obeyed his father, and it is also true in you because you will be obeying the commandment of Christ. The joy of the father was in him, and the joy of your salvation is in you. And that's why, if you remember, we read this in 1 John chapter 1, verse 4, when he said, our, in verse 3 and 4, he said, our fellowship with, with, is with each other. Our fellowship is with the father through his son. I'm writing these things to you. Why? So our joy may be complete. It is in you as is true, it was in him too. So be like Christ. Christ loved the Father and he loved his church. It is true in him and also will be true in you. You are to love God and you are to love the church. Is that clear? It is true in him. And it's also true in you. He loved the Father, loved His church. You love the Father and love the church. He obeyed the Father and fulfilled the law. You obey the Father and you do what you're commanded. Let's continue. Verse 15. No longer do I call you servants, for the servants does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all, I have, for all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, that your fruit should abide. Here you go. That's the new commandment. It should abide, that you should love one another. He says, he continues, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. Now, keep again your finger there. I hope you appreciate this because I can go through the whole passage and then 
But I want you to see really the links in every phrase. Go back to our passage. Keep your finger in John 15. Let's read verse 8 again. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him and in you. The following phrase, it says, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Why this is important? Because here, the true light is shining in what? I have chosen you. I have appointed you that you should bear fruit. Through the preaching of the gospel, you were regenerated by the light of the gospel. And so what? The light is already shining. What about the darkness that is passing away? In verse 18. The darkness that is passing away is the world. The fallen world. The sinful desires. The sinful nature is passing away. Behold, a new has come. You are a new creation in Christ. So verse 18. Let's read. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would, lo would love you as its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. I am holy. Be holy like I am holy. Leviticus. They do not know him. Verse 22. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. So now we can ask the question. You'll see it on the screen. The question is, what is the relationship of loving each other and the world's hatred? It seems like he ordered his passage in a way, the evangelist, the apostle John, that he says what's really, this is really curious. In verse 17 he says, so that you will love one another. I mean, everybody should be like, amen, right? That's great. We love one another. So why, he says in the following verse, if the world hates you, that it hated me before it hated you, why would the world hate on those who love each other? Well, it is rooted in what you mean by love. Uh, do you mean the love that is defined according to the parameters of God? We're talking about the love that is defined by the parameters of the culture. They are antithetical. They are going against each other. That's the problem. And so they think love is you accommodating their gender-confused identity. But reality is it is loving from us to tell the truth. Because how would they know that they are guilty of sin if they did not know the truth? They need to know that they have sinned and transgressed the law of God. Isn't this the first step of sharing the gospel? They need to know that they are sinners. They have transgressed the law of God. And therefore, you call them into repentance. You tell them, listen, you need to turn from your sinful ways and follow Christ's truly loving ways. He's the one who knows love. He is love. Love is from God. You will not teach God love. He is love. He is pure act. He is love itself. And so he surely knows what does love mean and how, what are the boundaries of love. And anyone who goes beyond the boundaries of love according to the word of God, it is not called love. It is called evil. It is called wickedness. And they ought to repent and turn to Christ. And that is why he's saying these two things together in the same order. Well, let me show you something even more curious. He maintains the exact same order in his epistle in 1 John. Let's go back to 1 John chapter 3 this time. Oh, 
We're going to pick up from verse 11. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain. And by the way, he's here referring to the law, to the Mosaic law. Who, ha- who was of the evil one and murdered his brother? And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life. What is death? The sinful world, the world that is passing away, the temporal world. What abides? The Word of God abides forever. The faith that we believe is eternal life. And so he says, so the the darkness that is passing away, that is death, he passed out of death, we passed out of death into life, into that light that is shining because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Whoever does not love his brothers, the children of the light, abides in what? In darkness. He's in death. He does not have light. He is not born again. He ought to be called back to repentance. Verse 15. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love that he Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother and in need yet closes his heart against him how does God's love abide in him little children here we have the same phrase again little children Let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. To that Christian who lives in isolation, that single isolated Christian, how can he practice what we just read? How? How in the world can he do that? It is not by just word. Oh, Jesus Christ is Lord. Oh, I I love Jesus. But it is in truth. Deed. We cannot be only hearers of the word, but we ought to be doers of the word. And so he says, we ought not to love in word or talk, but indeed we ought to love the brothers really, materially, actually, and in truth. Not based on whatever they think love is, but based on what Christ called love. So here's my question. You have a new screen. So do you believe and love the Lord Jesus Christ? If the answer is yes, then you ought to love your brothers and sisters in Christ. Here's the last passage. I want us to just turn the page in chapter 5. This passage will summarize everything we just talked about. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey His commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments and His commandments are not burdensome For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world that is passing away, that darkness. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Notice that those who are born of God in verse 1 are the ones who love the children of God in verse 2. And we love God because we keep His commandments. It goes back to really what Jesus said in Matthew 22. You ought to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And under that second great commandment, there is the new commandment. That is, you ought to love one another in the church. Yes, we ought to love my neighbor in general. We ought to be loving to all people in general. That is true. 
But what is the new commandment which is pertaining to this specific epistle? Is that you ought to love one another in the context of the local church. And his commandments are not burdensome. Let me ask you this question. Do you feel what we just discussed today is burdensome? Do you think the parameters of the love of God is too narrow? It's too heavy? It's too difficult to fulfill in the context of our society? Do you think they are too burdensome? Well, I have good news for you. Jesus Christ said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Those who love the Lord will obey His commandments, and they are joyful in it. They obey it willingly, no matter what will happen. They want to persecute us. They want to hate us. They want to call us out as enemies of good and just society. So be it. They will slander us. We know it. But we will love God with all of our hearts. And we will love our neighbor and each other. That is faith. That is the faith that overcomes the world. This fallen world is overcome not by might, but by the word of God. By faith, the world will be passing away. Behold, the light is already shining. Amen? Okay, so let's summarize all of this. First point, the Lord Jesus Christ died for his beloved bride, the church. Every faithful Christian must be, must be, underline that, must be a part of a local assembly. If he's not a part of the local assembly, if you know someone who calls himself a brother, who's not a part of the local assembly, please preach the gospel to them. They do not understand it. Number two, the commandment to love is rooted in God's holy character. Love is not subjective, it's not relative, but an objective moral imperative. What does that mean? You don't define love whichever way you want it to be defined. It is already defined in the Word of God. Number three, obedience to the new commandment is expressed in the context of the local congregation. Every faithful Christian desires, naturally, is inclined to fellowship and serve his or her brothers and sisters for the sake of Christ. So let me just really say it in one sentence. Very simple. This whole message it's to make you understand the simple truth. That those who are born of God, those who are born again, those who are Christians, join a church, love their brothers and sisters in a church, and obey the commandments of God. That's it. That's all it is. Amen? So application. Number one, learn the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith, which is on our website and you can get a copy if you'd like. I can give you one. Uh, but if you really are a hard copy type guy. Otherwise, the website is better. So you can actually click on the cross-references. You can actually read the passages pertaining to all of these doctrines. Specifically, chapters 26 of the church and uh, chapter 27 of the communion of saints. Reflect. And here's a good question. I want you to think about this. Maybe you want to write this down. Do I, ask yourself, do I love my brothers and sisters in my church? If so, do I enjoy spending time with them? Do I invest in my relationships with as many of them as possible? Not cliques, not those whom I'm comfortable with, but with as many of them as possible. Last slide. Apply. Here's a question. This is very important. Also, I want you to think about this. Otherwise, all the teaching we have just discussed today, it will just remain abstract. I want you to take it to the ground. How can I obey the new commandment and glorify God through my relationships within LCF? More specifically, what I'm asking is this. You can ask yourself, do I have to forgive a brother or sister? Or correct someone in error with Scripture? Help someone in need? encourage someone in distress, or give of my time and resources to serve in the ministry? These are practical questions 
for you to think about and apply. Okay? That's all I have for you today. Thank you for bearing with me throughout this sermon. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for it is indeed the truth. I pray, Lord, that you would indeed the same way you regenerated us, the same way you have caused us to be born again, I pray that we would grow in our sanctification, that we would grow in the knowledge of the Son of God, and also that we would grow in obedience to the new commandment, that we would love each other just as Christ have loved us. God, I pray for those who are in our midst who do not know you. I pray, God, that you would reveal yourself to them, that they would turn from the sinful ways and trust in the one and only Savior who came, who died on the cross to take the punishment that they deserve, that they can join with us and rejoice in this amazing salvation. I pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen.